join me in prayer. Lord, you said it, and we believe it. We thank you for your word that we're about to study. We thank you that every promise written in it is sealed in the blood of Jesus. That the Jesus who conquered death and sin is one who can break every chain. He can move what seems immovable to us. And so we come now and we surrender ourselves based on this thankful heart that we have of who you are and what you teach us from your word. And we ask now that you speak to us from your word. We pray this in the saving name of Jesus and all God's people said, thank you and be seated and thank you for the privilege to be with you. Again, my name is Greg and it is an honor to be here. I love your church. I've had a chance to be here a number of times, have a lot of friends here. Uh, enjoy working with some of the guys on your staff. Pastor Wes and Lisa, they are friends, and he is a great friend and encouragement to all kinds of pastors in Arkansas, including myself. And so I'm grateful that he's given me the opportunity to come and to worship with you today and to study with you. If you turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, um, we uh, I told the first service this morning that uh, this morning Pastor Wes sent a uh, a text to us, a lot of us said he's praying for us, and he said, now you tell him about Jesus, so we're going to do that today, man. I want to give you, share with you just a great relational passage of scripture here about our relationship with Jesus, and what I'd like to talk to you about today is prayer that conquers worry and brings peace. Prayer that conquers worry and brings peace. Now, it's interesting, I, as I'm studying scripture, especially in my own quiet time, when I'm just spending time with the Lord and I'm looking for a word or he's doing that work in my life, really two kinds of verses I like. I love instruction verses, right? I'm a simple, straightforward guy, like, just give me the plan, let me go do that, show me how to do it. And I also love promise verses. I think, uh, uh, just as we talked about in the worship today, God is so incredibly uh, majestic and powerful and loving, and he's given us these incredible promises. And it's always great to affirm that he said it, and I believe it. Well, this verse, these two verses here we're going to share this morning are awesome because they have a, an instruction and a promise. So let's take a minute here and look at God's word. You know, Paul wrote the book of Philippians while he's in prison. And it's always good to remember that context when he says something like this. In verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And so keep in mind as we look at the context of this scripture and our instruction we received this morning that Paul is in prison and he's telling us to rejoice. In the circumstances of life, he said, look, the circumstances are never greater than our Savior. And so rejoice always. Then he gives us this encouragement. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. So again, remember, this, although it's an instruction, this is a relationship passage right here. Then he gives us our instruction, don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses every thought will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So three things I want to show you this morning. The instruction, do not worry about anything. Written by a guy in prison, right? Don't worry about anything. The instruction. But the great thing about God's word is when he gives us an instruction, he always teaches us how to do it and why to do it. And so in this one, he gives us the instruction, don't worry, but he gives us the method of how we go about that, how we do that. And we'll look at that in a moment. And then he gives us that promise at the end. If you will do this the way I'm teaching you to do this, then the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So let's take a minute and look in that instruction. It's pretty straightforward. Don't worry about anything. But worry seems to be a part of life. And the more I walk through life with folks today, man, I'm telling you, the conversation goes like this. Pastor Greg, I'm worried about this. Pastor Greg, I'm worried about that. Pastor Greg, I'm worried about our country. Pastor Greg, I'm worried about our, uh, about our economy. Pastor Greg, I'm, I'm worried about COVID. And Pastor Greg, I'm worried about the responses to COVID. And Pastor Greg, I'm worried about my kids and how they're going through this. Pastor Greg, I'm worried about my job and how it's affected. I mean, it's just a time that it seems there's no solid ground to stand on. 
all of us know people who've uh, been struggling with COVID or all of that sort of stuff. Worry just seems to be in life and especially in a time like this now. And what God says is don't do that. Don't worry. Because you see, worry is in and of itself is a sin when we let it take control of us and move on. But it also uh, leads in other places if we're not careful. You know, when you worry, you get this sense of, I'm not in control. Don't understand what's going to happen. I don't know how to control what might happen. It's just a part of life. You know, the, uh, for some folks, worry is kind of their it's kind of their personality. You know, we all have sort of individual struggles that we all have that we work through with. And everybody's different, but everybody has them. You know, some people, worry is just a thing for them. Their personality is a little bit that way or, or some of those things they just struggle with. My mom is that way. My mom is a worrier. My dad used to say all the time, son, if your mama doesn't have something to worry about, she's worried about what she doesn't know that's coming. What am I going to worry about next, right? Now, the great thing about my mom is she's a prayer warrior, and somehow God used that process and scriptures like this to teach her how to become a prayer warrior. It's incredible. We spent some time with her in, in, uh, over Christmas, and, uh, and it's just amazing. I knew when my mom got up and went to her prayer chair. She has a chair where she studies God's Word and has her quiet time, and I know where she goes. And when she tells me she's prayed for me, I know that she's prayed for me. I know what that looks like. I've heard her do that. I know the chair she's sitting in when she's meeting with Jesus and praying for me. And so she's worked through that, and so some folks have that. I don't really have that. That's not my personality. My personality is I just kind of know stuff's going to go wrong. The wheels are going to come off, so you just don't react to it. You just figure out your way out of it. I mean, it's just kind of the way life works. In my house, my dad used to talk about Addison luck all the time. We have Addison luck. Stuff never goes right the first time. You just, it's kind of the way it is, and you just kind of deal with it. So you just kind of learn, you know. Um, I, I graduated one of my degrees from the University of Tennessee, and then uh, we lived in Arkansas for almost 20 years, and so my son is a Razorback, and in all that time, we sort of learned to call the hogs and enjoy that. And, and I love it when they actually play with each other. People ask you, you know, which one you root for. And all. I don't pick sides. It's my most fun day when they're playing together, right? But we have this sort of Addison Luck running thing, and my wife always picks on me all the time. Um, this football season, I'd turn on the game, and the balls would be winning, and we'd be running here. I'd get home, and I'd hurt. we got to get home. I'd turn the game on. As soon as I turned it on, they'd fumble or throw an interception. And my wife would say, why do you watch them? You jinx them every time you watch them, right? <laughs> And so, you know, I was looking yesterday, I thought, maybe I'll come a little early and watch the Razorbacks and the Vols play. That's kind of fun to do that together. My wife's like, no, if you go to that stadium, Addison, look, man, the lightning is going to strike it, the power's going to go out, and they won't even get to play if you show up. You know, so I'm just kind of used to that. It's just kind of like the way life goes, so I just let it roll off. But some people, it's a struggle with that. All of us have circumstances when worry becomes an issue. All of us face times. I mean... It's just a part of life that not everything goes well. Sometimes you go to the doctor, and it's a really bad visit, and you get terrible result. I mean, you get a terrible announcement to them about whatever. Sometimes you, your job does not work out. You're in that job, and it just doesn't work. and You have to do something else and face that transition. Sometimes in relationships, Just things don't go right, and somebody has a different opinion, and sometimes there's conflict, and it just doesn't go well, and it's not going well, and the trajectory of that creates fear, and it creates worry, and we find ourselves in these circumstances where we worry. And so remember, this is not a command from God where he's standing up in heaven, and he's pointing at us going, stop worrying, that's sin. Remember, this is a relationship passage. God loves us. It starts with, God is near. And it ends with, if you'll follow this and bring those requests to me personally, let's talk about these together, let me work with that in your life, then my peace is going to come through Jesus in your life. So remember, this instruction that he's giving us is a relational instruction that draws us with him. It keeps us connected to him. So keep that in mind. And why does he want us to do that? Because worry not only is it a sin in and of itself, because it's a lack of faith. In Matthew chapter 6, in the 
uh, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about this same passage. Why are you worried about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what's going to be provided? Your heavenly Father loves you and he knows. And if he's provided for, you know, if he's adorned the flowers in the field and he knows every time a sparrow falls out of the sky, don't you think he loves you and knows you? Don't you think he wants to provide? So it's a lack of faith when we allow it to become a struggle that takes control. But also if we don't deal with it, it's a gateway to other problems. You see, if you're worrying and you're wrapped up in that angst and that fear and that control, it stirs up emotions that create temptations and stuff in us. My, my uh, struggle, worries not, my struggle is I get mad. I'm, I, howling at the moon is my spiritual gift, right? I mean, I'm just frustrated with everything I'm mad. We get frustrated, we get angry, and that does things to us. It changes our perspective. It, it causes us to react in ways that's a problem. And if we don't give that worry to the Lord and learn this process, those emotions take control of us. That frustration takes control of us. For some people, it creates a depression or a, just a down, and we get in a hole, and we can't get out of that cycle if we don't learn this process of how not to worry. When you get wrapped in that cycle, then you begin to make decisions, and a lot of us, man, we'll make decisions. We, we start to do things we shouldn't do. Either we move into an addictive behavior because it's just driven us in that, or it's a trigger for that, or maybe we do things to salve the pain. We do some of those things that we do in life. Or maybe we just bail. We just go hunker down and hide from people and disconnect because of that worry. And so there's a reason that God tells us, don't worry. I want you to understand how to work through this because I love you and I don't want that to affect you and our relationship. It's a relational passage, so don't worry. That's the instruction Think, Pastor Rick, man, it's easy for you. It took you about four or five minutes even telling a joke to say that. But how do I do that? How do I do that in a circumstance like I'm in? Well, I love it. God's Word gives us what to do, and He always tells us how to do it and why to do it. So look at what He says here. We saw, we've seen the instruction. Now let's see the method of how we do that. How do I process not letting that worry take control? How do I engage in a faith exercise to be obedient to that instruction. Here's what he says. Through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so here's the first thing in that. Let your requests be made known to God. You come to the Lord and you give him your question. You give him your struggle. You come to him and you say, Lord, this is what I've got and I need you to deal with this. Lord, this is my question. I need an answer. Lord, I am pressed in by all of this, and I have got to have your strength and your presence. And make your requests known to the Lord. You don't just sit and hand ring. You don't just sit and worry. You come to him, and you tell him. You get alone with him, and you say, God, this is what I'm doing. This is what I need. This is what I don't understand. This is how I'm struggling. And you find that time where you get along the, with the Lord and you just do that with him. It seems a little simplistic, but after having pastored most of my adult life, I know one of the lost disciplines, one of the things we fail at the most is just like my mom, you find that chair, you find that place, and you intentionally get along with God and you let your requests be known. You can't just think about it. You can't just look for encouraging thoughts. You can't just come to church once every week or every other week and get a dose of encouragement and then cowboy up and gut your way through the rest of the time. No, we have got to have a discipline where we get before the Lord and we say, Lord, here it is, and you give it to him in that request. Some people, you know, we just sometimes we just get in this mode, we get in this cycle, and we just hand ring before God. What I call just hand ringing before God. We just we're just struggling. We're just we're cycling, and even if we think we're praying, we're just cycling about how terrible it is. My one of my first jobs in ministry, I was a singles pastor, and what you do. I loved being a singles pastor. It was great ministry, and a great opportunity because you spend a lot of time with people, relationships. They're making these incredible decisions. You do weddings and stuff. I've done a hundred. I lost count of hundred fifty something. I mean, I, I, it is, I know more about weddings than any male ought to have to know, right? 
And so, <laughs> and so what happens is you, you throw a party. We'd have everybody at our house. We did a lot of other stuff. And so they're all, you know, having fun and spending time. But they also need somebody to talk to, to ask questions, share things with, and they're living by themselves or whatever. And so you just end up, here's what happens. We throw a party. My wife's out there entertaining people, and I go stand in a corner, and I just stand there for three and a half, four hours while everybody just singles by one at a time, right? And so it's usually great. You're spending time. You pray with folks. You answer questions. You share things. But here comes this one dude, and I'm like, I'm like that guy's wearing me out. Lord, make him trip or something over there and not. I, 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 can't, I can't. I'm not in a frame of mind to do that again. And, here, and he's not a bad guy, but what happens is he gotten in this cycle. And he's like, Pastor Greg, I'm never going to have a wife. I'm always going to be alone. My career's not going like it was. And just always, and he's just on and on. You got to pray for me over this. You got to pray for me over this. You got to pray for me. I mean, I had more conversations with that dude about praying about stuff, and he just got worse all the time. Hand wringing before God. Y'all know what I mean? And so he comes and he tells me, he starts hand wringing, and I'm like, oh. And I don't want to blame this on the Lord. I, I, it turned out great, so I thought I'm going to take credit for being wise, but if you'll know what I'm saying. He goes in this deal, and I thought I had enough. And I just said, dude, just stop right there. I cannot pray for you anymore. He said, why? And I said, because the Bible says you have a finite number of prayer requests, and you've used yours up. <laughs> and he's like, no, it doesn't say that. Yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. We like revert to nine-year-olds. Yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. And he said, prove it. And I said, I don't have to prove it. I'm the pastor. You go out and study your Bible, and prove me is not. And I'm thinking, the Lord's going to come after me any moment. And I had to just, I, I, my thought was, i got to do something to break this cycle of hand-wringing. You can't just hand-wring before God. But you got to come and you got to say, this is what I need and this is how it works. And I want to focus on you as we're going to talk about in a moment. And he came back later, a week later, and I'm telling you, he's a different guy, man. He, he left and he said, well, what am I supposed to do? The Bible says I'm supposed to pray. I can't ask for any more prayer requests. And I said, well, I guess you're just going to have to pray for other people now because you can't, you know, you used up all your prayer requests. Well, he came back later. A week later, and he is like a different guy. His face had changed. His he was energetic. He's like grabbed me by the shoulders. I get it. I get it. You're so right, man. I gave it to the Lord, and I started serving, and I'm just, it's so good. And he just got it, you know. We get in that cycle. So it's not just hand-wringing before God. Here's what I'm stressed about. It is give him that request. Tell him. He knows anyway, so tell him. Then he says this, with, with, um, through prayer and petition. And I think what that is doing is grabbing that picture of just all prayer. I mean, prayer and petition is the same thing. It's all, but he expands that to give us that idea. You just bring it before God. And in every way that you can, with every prayer tool that you have, you come before him. The Bible talks often about crying out to the Lord. In the Old Testament, how many times have the children originally cried out to the Lord? My wife is in uh, Bible study, ladies' Bible study on Wednesdays. And, and they're studying through 1 Samuel. And I just happened to catch up few weeks ago, they were starting in the book, and they were talking about Hannah. And there's just a phrase, go back and read that when you have time. She goes to the temple, and she is crying out to the Lord. You know, she doesn't have a child. She desperately wants a child. And she just keeps bringing that to the Lord. And the, something I never noticed until I heard her, them talking about it, just registered in a new way. The Bible says there that God's presence was with her. God loves it when you come to him and you cry out to him. Bring that to him in every way that you can pray. Bring it all to him and just cry out to him. Give it to him. Tell him what your request is. Keep going back. When Jesus, when they came to Jesus in Luke 11, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. He gave them that version of the Lord's, uh, of the Lord's prayer in there. And then he went on to tell a story to teach them about consistently and persevering in prayer. And he tells a story about this guy uh, living in this town and a traveler comes at night and he visits him late at night looking for a place to stay. And his family's already eating the food and the refrigerator's empty. And don't you hate it when that happens? The refrigerator's empty. We're Baptists. You should never let a refrigerator get empty, right? And so he goes next door to the neighbor's house and he knocks on the door. Can you give me some help? Can you give me some help? The guy's like, shh, wife and kids are in bed. You're going to wake everybody up. Go away. We'll do it in the morning. He goes like, no, i got to feed this guy. And he keeps knocking, and Jesus teaches the lesson of that, and he says, the guy doesn't give him some food because they're friends. He gives him food because he's persevering. And then Jesus says, keep knocking, keep seeking, keep asking. Come to the Lord and ask. And so 
every petition and prayer, bring it all to the Lord and give him your request. And then the Bible says, with thanksgiving. And I think that's critically important. Sometimes we're really good about, God, I need you to do this for me. Sometimes we're really good about that. But sometimes we get stuck in that hand-wringing cycle because we forget the thanksgiving part. You think about worship this morning and what it meant to us. When we came and we sang, God moves the immovable. What would your perspective be for the week if you had not spent time in worship, focused on Jesus, the people of God helping you focus, and you get lodged in your mind, God moves the immovable. God breaks the unbreakable. I'm trapped in this chain, and I'm not in control of this, and it is creating this angst and worry, and I don't know if I can ever get out of this, but you come here, and you are reminded that God is a chain breaker, and he breaks what seems unbreakable. You are reminded that God said it, and he did it, and I believe it, and you are reminded of how much the Word of God means and the promises of God, and you sing that, and it calls you back to Scripture to anchor back in there in the methodology of coming to God, of listening to Him, of hearing His voice that He gives us. It is thanksgiving that changes the nature of these prayers. I believe it's thanksgiving that gives us that sense of, I can now leave this request with him, and he will answer because I'm grateful for who he is and what he's done in my life. Let me show you an exercise. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. This doesn't take very long to do in our prayer time. Like, it doesn't turn your prayer time in the morning from 20 minutes to, you know, like two hours. But it's incredibly powerful if you are learn this process. Find a passage of scripture or a verse that you love, a promise that you love, and take that verse and learn the exercise of saying thanks to the Lord for who he is and what he's done in that process as you're bringing your request to him. Watch how this changes everything when you, with prayer and petition, let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving. Here Peter is writing in verse 1, it says, to the temporary residents dispersed around the world. They're dispersed because of persecution. So just like Paul's in prison, Peter's writing to people who are in difficult circumstances just like us. So it fits in this worry discussion. And here's what he says in verse 3, praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a thanksgiving praise passage, so it fits in that instruction. So here's what he says, just watch this process. I'm in this circumstance. I can't control it. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I can't make this happen. I am worried about where it's going to end. I see all kinds of places where I'm going to land, but I'm going to ask the Lord what I need, and now I'm going to start to praise him. I'm going to ask the Lord in this circumstance when Peter reminds me, according to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth. Jesus, in his mercy, stepped out of heaven and died on the cross to pay the price for our sin. The Bible says he did that great mercy is fueled by his great love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Not that we loved him first, it says in 1 John, but that he first loved us and gave himself to be the payment for our sin. What is salvation? All of us are sinners by birth, by nature, and by choice. All of us have chosen to sin. All of us have messed up in that world. All of us in this room are old enough pretty much to understand we have a guilty conscience and there are things we've done we need to be forgiven for. And we've pretty much figured out we can't forgive ourselves. We can't clean up that sin. And that sin, the Bible tells us, is going to be judged by a holy God. But what the Bible tells us, and Peter reminds us to be thankful for right now, is that Jesus loved you so much, he looked down at the mess Greg made of his life and the sin and knew the judgment and hell and all of that, and Jesus said, I'm not satisfied with that result, and Greg doesn't deserve it, and Greg doesn't add anything to me, he doesn't add anything to anybody, but you know what? I love him, and I am merciful, and he stepped out of heaven, he lived a sinless life, and then he voluntarily went to the cross, and there he took my sin on himself and took it to the cross and died in my place so that I wouldn't have to pay the price for my sin. 
God, I'm in this circumstance and I've messed this up and the consequences are terrible. I don't know how I'm going to go through this. Lord, I don't, I don't have an answer to this. Lord, I'm worried about where this is going to end. Lord, I'm worried about it. But I know that you love me so much you said you died for me. Look at what he says, a new birth. You are born again when you're saved. You are given a life that is brand new. The Bible says in, first, in 2 Corinthians, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You have a new heart. You have a new mind. You have a new future. You have new abilities through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. You have a new sense of things. And you are reminded, listen, I'm worried about this, but I am a new birth. I am a child of God. I approach this differently than anybody else. I approach this as a blood-bought child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then he goes on to say, be thankful for this. He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus conquered death and sin. This ain't that bad. If Jesus can conquer death and sin, Jesus holds the keys to death and hell. In Revelation, he told John, listen, I am the one who was dead and now I am alive. And when I come into this circumstance, I don't need to be looking at the circumstances. I need to be grateful that the one who died for me rose again and conquered death and sin. And there is no promise in my life that he cannot accomplish when he conquers death and sin. And all of a sudden, my request looks different. God, this is bad. Lord, I don't know how this is going to go. But what I do know is you conquered death and sin. Thank you for being my Savior, the Alpha and the Omega, the keys to death and hell. Lord, I know who you are. I am grateful for who you are in my life. And now, Lord, I'm going to give this request to you, not based on how bad the request is, but I'm going to give my request to you based on you, the one who conquers death and hell. You see how it looks different? Man, life begins to change. Do not worry becomes a different instruction when we are bringing that request and we're giving it to the God who is the author and finisher of our faith. It is the God who loved us so much that he sent Jesus to be our Savior. It is Jesus, our Savior, who conquered death and hell. And because of that, he has given us a new birth into a living hope. Our hope is alive. It is well. We are never without hope in Jesus. And now why am I worried? Because I have forgotten to be thankful. And when I come now and I take that instruction, do not worry, I'm reminded God is not up in heaven pointing down at me and telling me what I'm doing wrong by worrying. No, it is the God who loves me. It is the God who is great in mercy. He's saying, don't worry because I need you to come to me so that I can step into your life. I need you to bring that request to me and I need you to be focused on what it meant that I saved you and how much I loved you and the power that Jesus has in your life. And I need you to bring that request to me so that I can remind you who you are. And I can remind you what I've done in your life. I can step into your life and bring all of who I am to bear in all of your struggle. And then you have the promise. When we have done that, when we have been reminded this is who Jesus is and what he's done in our lives, Then the promise comes. God will give you a peace that you can't even understand. In Christ Jesus, he will step in in his presence in your life and bring a peace and a comfort through an understanding of who he is and what he's doing that will guard your heart and your mind. It will keep you from that hand-wringing and that cycle. It'll keep you from making those choices. It'll break those cycles. It'll break those chains because who God is has stepped into who we are and now our focus is on him and we are walking with him in a way that we experience his presence and see the answers to our prayers. It is a prayer that conquers worry and brings peace. But it begins Again, this is a relationship passage. It begins by understanding my relationship with Jesus. It is when you come and you trust him as your savior that you can be thankful for a new birth. It is when you have trusted him as the savior who paid the price for your sins and cleansed you from all unrighteousness that you can begin to understand I can be in his presence and I'm new because of what he's done in my life. Have you ever trusted Christ as your savior? 
Have you engaged in that first series of prayers where you come to the Lord and you say, show yourself to me. Lord, I'm a sinner, and I know that my sin must be punished. And I want to trust Jesus to birth me anew. I want to trust Jesus to save me. I want to trust his death, burial, and resurrection to pay the price for my sins. And I want to know what it means to be a child of God and to have an inheritance in heaven that is undefiled. I want to know what it means to walk with a living hope. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, it's very simple. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and then all these people that love Jesus are going to stand, and they're going to sing a testimony of salvation, and you're going to see what it means when people have the peace of God in their lives, and we're going to invite you to come and to give your life to Christ. How do I do that, Pastor Greg? Well, you come. You can ask all the questions you want. It's not a hurried process, but it's very simple. You come, and you take your life, everything you've been, you are, and you ever will be, and you just give it all to Jesus, and he will give all of himself to you. If you're a brother and sister in Christ, I pray that this passage has been encouraging to you. A lot of this maybe was not earth-shattering, But it is in times of those circumstances when we are reminded to come back and be thankful for who God is and then bring our request to him in that sense of thanksgiving. So I pray that this has been encouraging to you. I want you to bow your heads. And I'm just going to ask you, have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior? If you've not, Ben will be here at the front. I'll be here. Listen, if you want to trust Christ as your Savior, you come. You come. Maybe your response is you've been in that cycle and and you want a prayer partner to pray with you and remind you and encourage you in those things. Reach out to someone around you in your small group or a deacon that you know or one of the staff guys or just come tell Ben that you need someone to pray with you. Respond this morning and know that God's relationship rises you above that struggle. Lord, we thank you for today and I thank you for this great church. I thank you for Pastor Wes and the staff and Lord, I just thank you for so many people that they encourage and the lighthouse that this church is to share the gospel and to bring people to Christ. And Lord, I pray this morning that if there's someone who's not accepted Christ as their Savior, just as the testimony we saw from Mabry this morning, Lord, I pray that someone else will see, I want to be born again. I want to be, I want a new birth to a living hope through Jesus. And you'll give them the freedom to come and to give their life to Christ. Lord, my brothers and sisters, I pray that you'll encourage them where they are. Equip them, draw them to you, give them a sense of presence through this process, this method you've taught us in Scripture. And I pray that they will know the peace of your presence 